First of all, when you look at growth in Europe, I want to come back to the kind of, you know, uh, the normalization of monetary policy, but do you think European growth has peaked? European growth remains strong. It was especially strong last year with 2.5% and with an acceleration in Q4. And we had some kind probably of setback in Q1 with 0.4%. Uh, but we think this is mainly due to temporary factors. We will look precisely at the data which will be published in, in the coming weeks. We just published for the French economy our first preliminary estimate at 0.3% for Q2, but economic orders remains positively oriented and we do not see at this stage a trend change. I mean, okay, uh, let, let, let me stress You're one thing. You're expecting it higher. Uh, the trajectory is kind of on our, the Our forecast well. for the URA economy this year is 2.4% uh -huh. published last March. So we'll see how it will be in June. But it's not an acceleration compared to last year. It remains at a very solid level with a broad-based broad -based growth. Um, Governor, you were at pains in saying at your speech that actually once the normalization process starts in terms of asset purchases, you won't be too quick or too, I guess, late in, in actually raising interest rates. How important is it that the market understand this correctly? Uh, First, we will have to decide about the end of the net asset purchases. As soon as SAPI, sustained adjusted path of inflation, is fulfilled. And as I already said, whether it will end in September or in December is not a deep existential question. And then we were very clear about the sequencing. We said that the first rate hike would come well past, I quote, the end of this net asset purchases. Uh, and uh, what I explained is that we will give probably additional guidance before the end of the, of the year about the timing of this first rate hike and about its contingency. Let me explain that. About the timing, well past, meaning at least some quarters, but not years. And about the contingency, it will be contingent also on the inflation outlook. Then we will see exactly how we formulate it. We are predictable, and it's a clear virtue of our gradual normalization path, but we are not pre-committed because we look at data and the economic situation as it is and as it will be. But, Governor, when you say some quarters, could, could we assume that's six months from, from that asset purchase kind of normalization, or could it be nine months? English is not my native language, but I understand <laughs> that some can mean several figures. Okay, so it can be up to three or even four. I will not comment more. Okay, Governor, when you look at the, the, the mm. main concerns or the main challenges for the ECB right now, mm. is it communication to the markets? Uh, I am, don't think we have specific concerns. We have clearly a mandate, which is price stability. And coming back in a mid-term perspective to a 2% inflation close to but below 2% uh, as the inflation target. So we are making progress towards this target. Despite some transient effects, inflation is at present rather low uh, in the Eurozone with 1.2% for the first estimate for April. But we think that inflation will resume its progress in the Eurozone in the coming months, and these are clearly temporary effects. So, uh, we are clearly focused on delivering our mandate on price stability. And we have been efficient because two years ago there was still deflation risk in the euro area. Last year we were at 1.5% and we expect inflation in 2020 to be at 1.7%. How much does a higher price of oil help in reaching your, your inflation target? Again, it's a mid-term objective, and this is very important. We look through transient phenomena, and energy prices are very often transient phenomena. If you look at recent months, uh, base effects on oil price play down on inflation. It could play up in the coming months due to the recent phenomenon you described, but it's our role to look through effects which would be transient. How much of a risk is you know, political tensions, trade wars, trade tensions between the US and China to the European economy? Uh, 
this is a very important topic. Our role is not to comment about political decisions, but it is to look at the economic, possible economic consequences of geopolitical decisions. And clearly trade wars, or let us call it protectionism, uh, could have detrimental effect on global growth. Through the effects of tariffs, if they were to be introduced, we estimate a 10% general increase of tariffs to slow down world growth by more than 2%. But also, and already perhaps through uncertainty it introduced, without having tariffs yet, but business confidence could be affected by the threat of protectionist measure. It's what we have seen in Great Britain, like the Brexit referendum, and it's what could be seen at present in some Northern uh, American countries like Canada. So we should be very cautious about avoiding as much as possible such detrimental measures to world growth. I know you won't talk about politics, but do you worry about the Italian economy because of possible populist measures? So maybe labor reforms being pushed back um, and, and fiscal spending increasing too much? Again, it's not our role to, to comment about politics, and it's still less our role to comment about domestic economic policy decisions, except for my own country, and this is, this is my role, and we clearly welcome the acceleration of reforms in France, which is very spectacular. But uh, if, if we look at, at the global picture in Europe, it remains very favorable. It is important that all countries use this economic environment to pursue a fiscal consolidation. And we should be extremely clear at the ECB, there will not be any kind of fiscal dominance. To put it in clear text, nobody should expect us to delay a warranted monetary policy normalization in order to accommodate the debt problems of any member state. Would you say the same worldwide? Is, is growth strong enough? We were talking about monetary policy normalization almost worldwide, but then we saw some concerns on growth uh, worldwide, which maybe were linked to what you were talking about with, with trade tensions. Uh, monetary policy is adapted to the domestic environment it has to deal with, be it in the Eurozone, in the US, or elsewhere. But what I said about fiscal consolidation in this favorable cyclical moment is true probably for other countries outside the Eurozone, including probably the US, uh, we shouldn't uh, develop, implement, or governments uh, shouldn't develop uh, pro-cyclical fiscal policies which could accelerate the cycle now but create problems in the future. Uh, Governor, mm. I know you, you don't want to talk about you know, individual uh, mm. domestic growth, but is, is there danger that actually German growth has peaked? And again, what does that mean for ECB policy? No, but uh, I, I come back to the Eurozone growth as a whole. It is high. It is robust. And you couldn't expect an acceleration forever. Again, the last quarter of 2017 had a growth of 0.7%, which was especially high. So there is some kind of stabilization. At this stage, we think temporary factors are at work, but we will study cautiously, as always, if there could be some changes due, among others, to the protectionist threats we, we discussed about. Uh, but we, we, we are not yet there. Uh, do you think the threats of currency wars has died down compared to two, three months ago? At present, we see no signs of currency wars. And clearly, we all committed the G20 members and all the IMF country to target our monetary policies according to domestic goals, mainly price stability, and not to target our exchange rate for competitive purposes. This is the precise wording of the G20 in Buenos Aires in March, of the IMF communique in Washington DC last April, and this is the way it should work, this is the way it works at present, which is good news. It brings stability in this uncertain world. Uh, I know the ECB officials, and you won't talk about a, a euro target or a euro level, but is there a range that you have in mind for the ideal euro level for, for you know, French exporters? The short answer is no. We have no exchange rate targets. We look at the effects of the exchange rate on our inflation outlook, which is a different story. 
uh, some months ago we said uh, disorderly or excessive volatility uh, of, of the exchange rate uh, required monitoring from our side. Uh, if it would be again the case in the future, we would probably repeat the same thing. Um, a final question. I actually have two, but I, ha I think I only have time for one on crypto assets. You were talking about it in your speech in, in relation to one of the questions. What form do you think they'll become, and can it be dangerous for, for central banks that it takes so much weight? First, you are right. It's about crypto assets and not cryptocurrencies, because as we said in the G20, they don't have the key attributes of a sovereign currency. The technology is very promising, blockchain, and we at the Banque de France are developing it in a very innovative way, but there are risks associated with these assets. But in the short run, not financial stability risks due to the rather low volumes, but risks about money laundering and risk about consumer protection. And on these two issues, the G20 uh, required the Financial Stability Board and the standard setting bodies, including FATF for anti-money laundering, to study adequate uh, responses till our next meeting in July. So expect more on these two issues. Uh, it's very important that we give precise guidelines to avoid um, threats, to, to avoid excesses from the development of this crypto asset.